All right, now I understand what Brother Grace said about this being a kind of like a type of heaven for you, but I'm afraid for some of you it's going to be a type of hell before the week's over. <laughs> you don't, uh, you don't appreciate the word, love the word. You're not going to like it around here. Not going to like it. You're not going to like me. That's for sure. I'll, I'll make some good solid enemies before I leave here, and and I'll start with that purpose in mind. And folks say, what makes you like that? Beats the fire to me. It takes all kinds to make a world, brother. You know, like a fellow said, you know, your, your friends come and go, but a good lifelong enemy will last for a lifetime. <laughs> now, I'm glad to see you still got a church here, and you still have a lot of people coming out to hear the word. And I'm glad to see you haven't lost your sense of humor yet. And the only thing I noticed about you, a little bit more refined than last time I was here, that sign out there says Bible Believers Conference. I believe the last time I was here it was a bad attitude Baptist blowout, you know. Well, you, you, you're getting you're just a little bit modernistic there. <laughs> of course, I can understand that, you see. I mean, with a fine, smooth, slick, cultured clergyman like you have for a pastor, I can understand. <laughs> what an irreverent congregation you have, brother. <laughs> Oh, just kidding, just kidding. I've raised Episcopalian. You won't. You get up early in the morning and get by me, man. I tell you, in a church where they don't laugh and don't shout and don't cry, I think something's wrong. I've raised one of them churches. Now, I'm down south, way down south. How many of you never heard me before? Let me see your hands. Every while, a couple of, maybe a hundred or so here tonight. And this is going to be kind of a shock to you. In the first place, you're probably not used to have a minister draw or preach to you with his back toward you through half the message. And the second place, I'm a right-wing conservative. I mean, down where I'm from, they're extreme, boy. Down where I'm from, they practice maneuvers out in the bushes with dummy grenades, you know, that kind of thing. We think Reagan is a communist. <laughs> And I'm old-fashioned. I'm not old-fashioned because I was raised that way. I was, I'm become old-fashioned through God pounding me into shape. I was a Roman Catholic before I was saved and a good Catholic. My tit tat toe three in a row, you know. <laughs> hey, I'm Mary, full of grapes, through the loom, and all that business. <laughs> how, many, how many of you were Roman Catholic before you were saved? Would you stand? I want you to stand. Now, remain standing here now. I remain standing there. I want to show you why the Pope doesn't like us Baptist preachers. You haven't got that many converts to Catholicism in 10 years in any city in the world unless they intermarried. They don't convert by belief. This bunch is converted by belief. I mean, you weren't converted because you intermarried. You just intermarried, you know. You didn't dedicate your daughter to be a Baptist nun. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you all have a seat. Now, let me ask you one more question. How many of you believe the King James Bible is the Word of God before you ever heard of me? Let me see your hand. Before you ever heard of me. Well, let's, let's cut all this Ruckmanite crap then, okay? All this stuff. I, I, get, I get sick and tired of being blamed for the work of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's right, man. That's right. I mean, if, if the Holy Spirit that taught you that book was the Word of God, not me. You'd think some of the brethren wouldn't confuse me with the Holy Spirit, would you? <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Now, you have, the, you have the privilege this week of hearing the only uh, Ph.D. in America whose books are banned at Christian bookstores. <laughs> <laughs> me and Jack Chick are getting the same thing, except uh, uh, my books are banned on college campuses, Christian college campuses. We have, a, we have a game down in the south. It isn't called Pac-Man. It's called Ruckman. <laughs> and it's a little old thing that runs around a board and eats up college professors and spits them out. <laughs> and, and folks say, you know what, Ruckman, I just don't appreciate your language, the way you say things. I know, I know, I know all about it, all about it, you know. And, no, like you both can. I know, I know. You don't have any love. I've heard all the stuff, you see. And you may be right, <laughs> but that's what God called me to do. I wish, that, I wish a dozen times that God had just called me to draw pictures for television, pretty pictures, and get people saved, 
on television, but he's never given me that ministry. My ministry is a, God wants me to attack fundamentalists who mess with that book. I, I'm not telling you to do it. I'm not telling you to follow me, imitate me. That's what God wants me to do. That's what I do. That's my ministry. My ministry is just irritating the tar out of people. That's my job. All right, now I'll give you a little honey tonight. If you have a Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's look at verse 3 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 4. I'll tell you what, get that in one hand, get Hebrews chapter 12 in the other. Hebrews chapter 12 in one hand and 2 Corinthians chapter 1 in the other. I'm going to talk tonight a while about the basic problem. The basic problem is so basic that the oldest book that was ever written was written about this problem. And if you, know what the, if, you, if you want to know what the basic problem is in life, I can tell you in five seconds without turning a page of any book. The basic problem in life is why do the righteous suffer? That's the problem. That's the basic thing. That's behind the crucifixion. That's behind Paul in, in jail and suffering. That's behind the, some of the things you and I go through. There's no, there's no problem about why do the wicked suffer. They have it coming. The problem is when you do right and do the best you can, why do you get it in the neck? That's the problem. Murphy's Law, no good deed shall go unpunished. <laughs> now, see, that, that's the problem. And the oldest book I've ever written is not the Book of the Dead. Matter of fact, the Book of the Dead is not even a book. That's just a collection of... a Well, we got a thumbtack or a... Uh, a uh, Staple gun, I can put them there, okay. Uh, the oldest book in the world is not the Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead is just a, a, a loose collection of a bunch of pieces of paper they put in Egyptian coffins. Don't they ever kid you about that? The Book of the Dead has no plot, no characters, no purpose, and no prophecies. It's just a bunch of pieces of paper somebody put together. The oldest book in the world is the Book of Job. And the Book of Job was written before Moses ever sat down to pen Genesis. I know the events in Genesis take place, many of them before the book of Job, like the first 15 chapters, but the book of Job was written before the book of Genesis was written, and that's very significant. That's very significant because the book of Job, the book of Job records a, a detailed analysis of the great problem. Why do the righteous suffer? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, you start down through there. You have forgotten the exhortation who speaketh unto you as unto children, saying, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint thou the rebuke of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God deal with you a son, for what a son is he whom the Father chastens not. Now look at that thing carefully. Number one, it said you forgot something. You children of God, you forgot something. You forgot the exhortation that talks to you as a son. Well, if you're a child of God, you're a son of God, Amen. All right, then you need this exhortation. And the exhortation is you've forgotten an exhortation that says, my son, two things. First of all, don't despise the chasing of the Lord. When God takes out the, the whip or the rod and lays it to you, don't turn up your nose at it. Don't say, oh, well, it could happen to anybody. Don't say, oh, well, it's just an accident. Well, it's just bad luck. See, don't despise it. That's the first thing. Now, the second thing is, don't faint under it. What does that mean? That means don't quit. The two attitudes you can get that are wrong. The first one is a devil may care. I don't care, so what? I can take it. That's one attitude. That won't get you anywhere, except more slashes and lashes on the back. <laughs> and the other one is don't get uh, defeated and discouraged and say, well, God's just against me, and I can't make it, and God's mad at me, and the dice are against me, the dice are loaded, there's no way to get back on top and it's too late now, and I can't recover, and I can't be what God wants me to be, so I might as well quit. That's fainting, see? Don't despise, don't faint. All right, come on now a little bit further. And he says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And scourgeth what? Every what? Every Again. Every Louder. Every you see, we give a wrong uh, 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 attitude to folks about that thing. We tell them, well, now, you know, if you're backslidden and get out of fellowship with the Lord, the Lord will whip you. And if the Lord doesn't whip you, that's proof you're not his child. See? 
Because if you endure chastening, God be with you a son. For what son is he whom the father chasten not? But if he be without chastisement, keep on reading down there, where of all the partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So we preachers are largely responsible for a false attitude about that thing that gives you the idea that uh, only when you're backslidden do you get whipped. But that is what the verse said. The verse said he scourges what? Every son, good or bad. You say, what if I'm good? Will the Lord whip me? Yeah. You say, what for? On credit? <laughs> you might do something bad. <laughs> didn't you ever treat your kids that way? I mean, if you didn't, didn't you ever think about it? You know, uh, I haven't seen my brother for many years. I've seen my brother one time in 37 years. He's up in years now and, and well on the way to the grave. And he and I got together one time after we hadn't seen each other for 37 years, and we compared notes, and I, did, I couldn't understand what he was talking about. He kept talking about my father. Old Colonel John Ruckman, about what a dangerous man he was, and a wild man, and uh, how a, what a brutal, terrible man he was. That wasn't the father I knew. My father, he whipped me, I guess, an average of once a week for about 10 years, and he used a big old bell up in the, in the, in the locker that went around a steamer, uh, in the attic around a steamer locker, about that wide, about eight feet long, double that thing. But I never thought he was brutal because uh, he never got me as many times as I deserved. <laughs> you see, I knew sometimes he missed. <laughs> so I was glad I got just what I got, you know. Now you take whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chasing, God be with you as with sons. For what son is he when the father chastens not? Now, I'm going to talk about why do the righteous suffer, and you must understand the context of this message. I am not talking tonight about why people suffer who don't tithe. I'm not talking tonight about why people suffer who don't go to church. I'm not going to talk tonight about why people suffer who smoke. You ought to be able to figure that out. I mean, I'm not going to talk tonight about why people suffer that uh, don't uh, pay the bills and don't pray and read the Bible to the family. I'm not going to talk about that tonight. I'm going to talk about tonight about why people suffer who go to church and tithe and love God and read the Bible and pass out tracts and try to win people to Christ and live a clean life. I'm talking about that. Or right, take your Bible out and flip back over there to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and look at verse 3 and verse 4, where Paul is saying, Blessed be... Uh, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all mercies, the God of all mercies. And he says something about this God. He says, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we might be able to comfort those that are in any kind of trouble. By that, any trouble, by that comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. All right, the first reason why good people suffer good people that love the Lord, that bleed the book. The first reason why they suffer is to make them sympathetic with those who are in trouble. If God's going to use you and do anything with you on this life, and your life is going to be anything more on this earth than just eating and raising a family, dogs do that, if you're going to, if you're going to think more on this earth than just breed and pay bills, you're going to have to suffer. You say, why? Because you can't minister to people unless you do suffer. I don't like that verse. I don't care for that verse a bit. I believe the Bible, there are all kinds of verses in the Bible. If I could change them, I'd change them. <laughs> you know why? Because I don't like what they say. You realize what that verse read that you just read? That? You know what that thing said? That thing said that I have got to be familiar with everybody's troubles so I can comfort those that are in any trouble. Boy, what a load. Now listen, if you're going to be a minister and minister to people and do any good with them, you know what you're going to have to do? The first thing, the first requirement for you is you better be familiar with trouble. Do you know why these liberal modernist preachers are, are, can never reach you? Because they don't know what trouble is. These felt like Norman Vincent Peale. Well, what, a, what a blank. I mean, I mean, dear Dr. Peale, my husband ran off and left me uh, I've got terminal cancer. I'm doing a belly dance and a burlesque show. Uh, I believe I'm saved. Should I stay here and witness or leave the job? <laughs> Dear Betty Boop, <laughs> it's 
stay where you are and be a sweet Christian testimony to those around you. Why, that fool, that fool, that silly fool. All these liberals, you know what the trouble is? They've never been through anything. Hugh Pyle says, Paul is appealing, but Peel is appalling. <laughs> They've never been through anything. You take that fellow Buttrick, that liberal, unsaved, modernistic liberal, no heaven, no hell, no virgin birth, no deity of Christ, all this and that. That fellow was over in Japan one time preaching, and I had a missionary friend over there who knew a little Japanese, not a lot, but he went to hear that Buttrick speak, who was representing the National Council of Churches, one of the greatest communist organizations in America, and he got up there to speak, and an interpreter interpreted him, and Buttrick got up there and just wasted everybody's time, you know about uh, sharing relative values and meaningful lifestyles and positive thinking, all that baloney and all. And he went through all that stuff and the Japanese interpreter interpreted at the end of the message, they played a closing hymn and about 40 Japanese came down and knelt and got saved. And this missionary friend of mine went to this interpreter and said, why you weren't telling him what he, what he was saying? And the interpreter said, you write me, tell him about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he blew that boy. He blew that. He fixed that up. Now listen, do you ever stop thinking about this? Do you ever stop thinking about what a funny idea people in America have about Jesus? Who is this Jesus you're talking about? Just love everybody and hug me, kiss me, darling, all this stuff, and God loves you, and let's share God's love. Do you ever stop thinking about what he went through? It's blood. It's sweat. It's nails. It's spit. It's a whip, it's tears, it's naked, it's suffering. You can't, you can't separate the love of God from suffering. You can't separate the love of God from shame. You know about God loving you? Yeah, where? I'll tell you where, Calvary. Calvary. Suffering, suffering. That's the business. Before I was saved, I went to Episcopal Church. And before I took Catholic convert courses, I went to the Episcopal Church. I was raised, you know, and confirmed and Christian and all that business, Episcopalian. That's Anglican, High Church of England, boy. And you taking that thing, that preacher, <laughs> preacher, that clergyman or rector, that's a good name for him, rector. <laughs> that, fellow would, that fellow would get up in that split chancel, you know, and say, you know, the Lord is in his holy temple and all the earth keeps silence before him. Amen, 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 amen. I'm sitting there thinking, ah, rats. <laughs> one of those, one of those clergymen over in England was preaching away, preaching. That isn't the word for it. He's talking away, and he was talking away, you know. And after a while, I fell up in the balcony, got up and said, uh, I say, Reverend, he said, would you mind speaking a little bit louder? <laughs> so he raised his voice to a whisper and went on for a ways. Pretty soon he got in the back and he got up and said, and said, I say, Reverend, I can't hear you. And about 10 minutes later, he said, Reverend, and a fellow on the front row who could hear turned up and stood around, stood up and turned around and said, I said, boy, can't you hear? He said, no, I can't hear. And he said, well, thank God then and sit down. <laughs> That's the business. Amen, brother. Amen. Now you say, well, what a way to talk about this. Shut your mouth, you hypocrite. Listen, you won't be out of this building. Five minutes you'll be talking about me. Don't you, don't you give me that stuff. Don't you give me that stuff. Don't you sit there and go and say, what a way to talk about people's origin, this and that, and so forth and so on. Listen, I sat and went to hell on those fellows for 15 years. You better get it straight while you can get it. All right, you take sympathetic, sympathetic. What is God going to do with you? Nothing if you're not familiar with trouble. You have to have trouble to be sympathetic. I've been in places, I'm sure Brother Grace has been in places, I'm sure there isn't a pastor in this building that has been, in, if you've been a pastor very long, you haven't been in a place where you felt absolutely helpless to minister. Now, I've been in a place like, I know what to say, I know what the verses are. By the time you've been in ministry 30 or 35 years, you know where to turn, you know what to pray. I'm in Bear Hunt's bedside, day before yesterday, been dying of some killing disease for about 11 years, bones falling apart, hadn't been on his feet for 10 years. I know what to pray. I sit beside him and pray, Lord, hope you'll take him home soon. Bear's crying, I saw me hurt your feelings, man, if I was the condition you in, I'd want somebody to pray for me like that. 
He said, I do want God to take me home. He said, I've been praying for months for God to take me home, but why doesn't he do it? You don't answer that question in five seconds. Sonny, your Greek lexicon won't help you a bit. You see, there's some things in that book you learn by going through them. You don't learn by looking up some, what some nut thought they said. Now, you've been through things like that. Right after, I was, well, right after I began to preach, I'd only been preaching, I guess, about two years. I was a young preacher and just started green boy. I mean green. I was a green boy. If you'd stuck me in the ground, I'd have rooted. <laughs> and, and I was called over to Mobile, Alabama one time, and I was called over there to deal with a lady. She's about, oh, about 45, maybe up there somewhere. And she had two boys, and she'd raised those boys from infancy and got them all through hoop and cough and, you know, scarlet fever and measles, you know, and chicken pox and all that business, and mumps, and got them upgrown, got them saved. They both of them trusted Jesus Christ. Then she got them through World War II, and they got overseas and got back without getting killed. And then she uh, prayed and prayed for them, and finally the Lord called both of them to preach. And both those young men, one about 24 and one about 22, were over in uh, J. Frank Norris' seminary over in uh, Texas studying for the ministry. And they came back home one night along that Gulf Coast there in the, in the, around Christmas time, just real foggy along that highway around Pascagoula and Bluxy and Gulfport. And they come along there and something in the fog had parked up ahead of them half off the road and left the car sticking out in the back end. They hit that thing at 50 miles an hour and killed both those boys in about five minutes. Now I went by and talked to that woman. She's in bed, lying there, just staring straight out ahead of her. I'd pray with her. I knew what to pray. I read the promise of the Word of God. I know what the promise are. I know what to read and all this and that. But you know something? I just felt all the time I was talking to that woman and dealing with her and I wasn't reaching her. And I just wasn't. I never lost two children in one day. I never lost one child. Now, I sure haven't lost any two of my kids in one day after getting them all the way through childhood and clear up grown like that. And I'd do what I could, but I wasn't getting through there. I learned something right then and there. I learned that if I was going to minister and do what God wanted me to do and be a blessing to people, I was going to have to go through something. And I didn't like it. I didn't like to think about it. I don't like to think about it right now. My flesh resents that. It cringes. It pulls back. When I first got saved, I had a funny idea about preaching. And of course, I got my idea about preaching from the fact that my people are all military people. I got four generations of military blood in my veins. You don't get over it. I say military blood, staff officers, general staff, West Point, that kind of thing. I don't mean just draft. And you get that stuff in your blood, it's awful hard to get rid of. I'm up here on a platform. I've been on all kinds of platforms. A platform like this with a bullhorn. Sometime without a bullhorn. And I've been up here training fellows in hand to hand, close combat, unarmed combat, how to kill a fellow with your hands, tent peg, pencil, knife, teeth, anything. Teeth are good. Teeth are good. <laughs> and train them how to do those kind of things. And when I first got saved, I thought that preaching was a contest between me and the audience to see who could endure to the end. <laughs> <laughs> And after a while, after I've been preaching about two or three years, you know what I got through my thick head? It suddenly occurred to me those folks out there, a lot of them uh, had broken homes and dead babies, and they were turning off the electricity and turning off the gas, and the fellow couldn't pay his bills. My wife was by herself raising three kids by herself, trying to get a babysitter, and the babysitter was taking up all the money, and the car was breaking down, you know, and the kid had leukemia, and the poor little girl was an oxygen tent and all that kind of stuff. I began to see something. I began to see if I'm ever going to minister, I'm going to have to go through it. And if I don't go through it, I'm not going to be able to minister. Take your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 3 and look at verse 10. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. The writer of Hebrews in the context you just read, back there coming down through about verse 10, so we've had fathers who are the flesh who chased us a few days after their pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be made partakers of his holiness. Do you know, you know one reason why the righteous suffered? Do you think Paul was backslidden when he wrote that? Do you think Paul was backslidden when he was getting whipped? Do you think for the Lord had Paul whipped and thrown in jail and all that business because he was backslidden? No, no. 
Paul's a, probably a good a Christian that ever lived. He was so good he could say, follow me as I'm a follower of Christ. He's so good that he said, I'm a pattern for those that could hereafter believe on uh, Christ, a life everlasting. That's how good he was. But he sure suffered. Now, you don't find very many Christians ever suffered like Paul suffered. What was the problem? Well, Philippians chapter 3, along about verse 8, 9, and 10 there, he's praying. And he's praying for something. And he says, Lord, I want to get something. And the Lord says, what do you want? And he says, I want to know about the power of your resurrection. Praying for power. Power of the Holy Ghost. I want the power of your resurrection. And he prays. He doesn't get it. And he prays and doesn't get it. He prays and doesn't get it. And after a while, he said, Lord, I've got a feeling of something. I'm forgetting on this prayer or something. Yeah. The Lord says, yeah, there's some part there you're leaving out. And Paul said, what's that? And the Lord said, you forgot that business about the fellowship of his sufferings. He said, passage there, be made conformable to his death, that I might know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. <clears throat> What's that? Dying on a cross. You look forward to that? Not me. Not me, man. I'm carnal. Paul makes me nervous. <laughs> He's always on high ground. He never gets defeated. I don't like people like that. <laughs> I like people get depressed and down the dumps and complain. They remind me of myself. <laughs> Um, you realize when you realize, read those 13 Pauline epistles, you can't find one time there where he ever complains about anything? Read them, mark it, mark it, go through them and mark it. Job complains. I like Job, he complains. <laughs> <laughs> you take David, he complains. You take Moses, he complains. Am I a nursing father? I should carry these people. My, they get going, God, some time. Job says, Why don't you leave me alone? Let me swallow our own spit. They get upset. You take Jonah, I sure I do well to be angry to death. <clears throat> Go on and kill him. <clears throat> but not Paul. Paul, everything's fine. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Whip, jail, hallelujah. No father, no mother. Glory to God. No wife, no children. Praise the Lord. <laughs> no bus ministry, no church, no school. Bless God. No pension, no social security, no insurance. Glory to God. Hallelujah. No grave. What a, what a thing, man. What a thing. Now listen, that fellow had power. You know where he got his power from? The fellowship of Christ's suffering is being made conformable unto his death. I guess the biggest joke in this country is, is this PTL bunch, this, this 400 bunch. That is the biggest joke, always talking about the Holy Ghost and the power and the baptism, why you haven't got the power to bust your way out of a paper bag. You know how I know you don't? Because you're always talking about getting healed and getting money. Well, tell me something, you, you spiritual midget. If you're always in good health and your bills are always paid, where's the fellowship of this suffering? Power of the Holy Ghost. Ah, nuts. You go kid your grandmother, okay? Don't kid me. Don't kid me. I've seen, I've seen the big ones, boy. I've seen the lions. I've seen old Jane McGinley stand up there preaching. He's dead now, face white, holding on to his side in pain. That old boy get through preaching, man, you feel like you had a sawn in a Turkish bath and a rubbed down with a Turkish towel and, and been to a steam bath and taken three bottles of vitamins. And that fellow, he could minister, boy, he could minister. You know why he could minister? He's hurting. The fellow said to me one time, or I said to him, I said, uh, uh, what's the situation there in McGinley? Why do they hold his side like that? He said, well, don't you know? I said, no. He said he's got a, a one kidney, got a stone in it. I've seen old Phil, uh, Bob Shuler preach. Now, I'm not talking about that freak out there in Hollywood now. I'm not talking about the fellow out there in the Chinese theater, you know. But I'm talking about old Bob Shuler who's from Virginia. He used to pass the Trinity Methodist Church. And Bob Shuler, that old fellow, I've seen him stand up in a pulpit with a left eye half shut, the left side of the mouth almost paralyzed, couldn't move the left arm, had a stroke about a month before he got up there, 2,000 miles from where he should have been, against doctor's orders, standing up there preaching. He sat up there and preaching to some dogs I have known. Let me tell you something, I heard those fellows preach 30 years ago, I could repeat almost every word they said verbatim. 
You know what great preaching is? Great preaching is where when the fellow delivers it to you, it sticks. You don't just brush it off and say, what was that? It sticks. And it doesn't stick where there's no power of the Holy Spirit. It just goes off your back like water off a duck's back. You take those old boys there, old McGinley and that bunch, they could minister. I mean, brother, they could minister. Phil Schoener, Bob Schoener get up there and preach, and his, his theme of some dogs I have known, at the end of every point, he wind up by saying, a dog never has a soul, a dog will never walk the streets of gold, a dog will never know what it's like to sit on the throne and sing the praise of God, but the more I know about dogs, the less I think about some Christians I've known. <laughs> he preached that dogs are loyal, but Christians aren't. And dogs are patient, but Christians aren't. And dogs are courageous, but Christians aren't. Boy, let me tell you, he got through with you. You know you've been worked over. <laughs> that guy got through there, and when he got through with the message, he sat down, and the audience just sat there. 2,000. He got up and came back to the pulpit and said, that's all the message. I'm through. You can go home. Went over and sat down. Nobody moved. He got up and came back to the pulpit and said, that's it. That's all the message. And after a while, one began to move out here, and one began to move out there, and one began to move but that fella, you know what that fellow had? He had the power of God on him, boy. You didn't hear him all this nonsense about baptism in the Spirit. God bless you. Pray the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. Let's share God's love. Oh, share. Oh, God love you. Oh, Jesus is Lord. All that bunk. That fellow was hurting. And while he was hurting, the Holy Spirit was ministering to him and through him. And boy, that bird could minister. You better believe it. Years ago, there was in this country a great Cole Porter. That's the fellow who passed out, not the songwriter. This is a different word. And he passed out tracts and Bibles and things. And his name was Uncle John Vassar. Uncle John Vassar had remarkable power. When he come into a town, revival would break out just almost automatically. And he wasn't an ordained minister. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't an evangelist. He'd just travel up and down, knock on doors, witness, pass out tracts. One of the greatest personal soul winners that ever lived. And one town he came into, well, here in New York, I forget where it was, might have been, might have been Rochester, back around the time of Finney. And he, came, he got, got in this town, the fellow said, I'm going to find out what his power is. That old man has peculiar power with God, and I'm going to find out what the secret of his power is. So this fellow went up and hid under Uncle John's bed. He found the hotel where Uncle John was staying and hid under his bed at night. And he saw when the old man comes in, goes to bed, he'll have to pray. And when he kneels down to pray, I'll hear his prayer and see where he gets his power from. So he hid under the bed, and he got under the bed, and about 8 o'clock, Uncle John came in. They got to bed early back in those days. And he came in there and sat down on the side of the bed for a while, and didn't say anything. Fell under the bed and listened, nothing happened. And pretty soon he turned down the gas lamp, nothing happened. Pretty soon he kicked off one shoe, then the other shoe, nothing happened. They lay down on the bed. And the guy under the bed said to himself, surely he's going to pray. He's got to pray here in a minute. But he didn't pray. And Uncle John lay in that bed, I guess, about an hour. And after about an hour, he gave a great big sigh and said, good night, Jesus. He'd been talking to the Lord all the time. At about 2 o'clock in the morning, that guy under that bed got under such conviction he could have died. About 2 o'clock in the morning, old Uncle John got up and began to walk that room and rub his arms. He had arthritis in his arms so bad at night he couldn't sleep. And he's walking up down that room at night, rubbing those arthritic arms, and he was saying, Oh, my God, how much better this is than sin. Oh, my God, how much better this is than sin. You heard that on PTL lately? It's a different breed. It's a different breed. This bunch here is praying for the confirmation to his death. The fellowship of his sufferings. Why? That I might know the power of his resurrection. You know why some of the righteous suffer? They suffer to be partaker of God's holiness. You know why they suffer? They suffer so the Holy Spirit can work through them and get stuff done. And I'm not talking about backslidden people. I'm talking about good people love the Lord and believe the book. I'm talking about soul winning people. You say, Brother Robert, that's a hard message you're preaching. Yes, it is, isn't it? I don't appreciate it more than you do. I just do not talk about these things. But I've been saved now for about 35 years, and I made up my mind when I got saved and got in that book and began to know that book that I would preach all the counsel of God, come a hell or high water, no matter what, and we took the skin off my nose, my nose would just have to come off of the congregation. 
You can't preach all the counts in that book without getting yourself under conviction somewhere. No way in the world. Are some of you feeling kind of nervous right now? Some of you twist around like you've got a horn in your shirt. It's just as hard on me as it is on you. <laughs> I'm flesh and bone just like... Do you think there aren't some pastors in that book that upset me? Listen, if I'm one of these, one of these lunatic friendly fellows like... Um, I wouldn't say the name because they're up, they get kind of sensitive. You know, these guys like Henson and Dobson and Appman and Porter and Martin and the rest of them. <laughs> and if I was like one of those fellows always messing with that Bible, I know what verses to mess with. Why, they, why, why I pick up a Bible, I, it doesn't take me five minutes to tell whether the guy that translated the thing is sincere or not. I don't care if he's saved or not. I'm not even interested in that. A lot of, unsa- a lot of saved folks are mean as the devil. If I was a queer, if I was a pervert, I know what I'd change in that book. I know where the verses are. I can turn to them in five seconds. If I stepped out my wife and put out a new translation in better language you could understand so it wouldn't be covered up by the archaic Elizabethan English, I know what verses to change. I turn right to them. If I was a fellow who was proud of my degrees, and I've got the degrees, but some men die by degrees, <laughs> so I don't ever boast about the degrees. But if I was proud of my education, I know what verses I'd mess with. I know right where they are. You bet your booties. That, that, that book is harder than anybody's flesh. How do you think I feel when I read through there and it says, be courteous? <laughs> oh. 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 You see, that isn't the original Greek. <laughs> You know, foolish jesting, <laughs> which is not convenient. <sighs> now listen, if you want God to use you and you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, there's something you're going to have to go through. You're going to have to suffer. You're going to have to be made conformable to Christ's death, and that's a slow form of torture. It's crucifixion. Am I nothing pleasant about it? I don't like it. My flesh doesn't like it, but there it is. That's it. That isn't all. Lord, do something else. Take your Bible and turn to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. This red chalk don't go on here too good. What's the matter with it? Made in America for suckers, I guess. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Mortify your members which are on earth. Talking about in Christ, your life is going to appear. And then he says, down there about verse 3 someplace, set your affections on things above and not on things on this earth. Now look at that thing. I believe that's the most disobeyed commandment in the entire Bible. I believe the Bible that Americans and maybe overseas with the persecuted people and maybe something else, but American Christians that I've known through the years and preached up and down this country in the state after state, in church after church, I believe the commandment they violate more than any other commandment is that commandment right there. That commandment that says, set your affection on things above and not on things of this earth. Did you know that's very difficult to do? Have you ever tried to do it? If you think that's easy to do, I know one thing about you. You never tried to do it. You love your wife? She's on this earth. You love your children? They're on the earth. It's very difficult to love things you can't see and feel and touch and smell and taste. Very difficult. Some of you love your lawn, your property, your house, your car. Tell me something. What what minister that is thankful thankful for what God gave him, what minister doesn't appreciate his ministry? What minister wouldn't have a hard time disengaging his affections from the buildings God gave him and the flock God gave him and the ministry God gave him? You say, for what? For things above. Why, bless your heart, people. You folks up here, most of you here tonight, you believe that book from cover to cover, including the cover, and I know you do. I don't have to preach about infidelity or anything like that or apostasy or anything like that. But if the truth were known, if somebody passed out a sheet of paper right now around this congregation, and ask you people to write down that sheet of paper, six, five or six things up in heaven your affections are set upon. Some you have to put the end of that pencil in your mouth and your tongue and wet it trying to think of what they are. Sure getting quiet around here, preacher. You see, that's a commandment. Set your affection things above. Have you done it? 
down at our church down there. We don't run near as many as you do, you know. We got about five or six hundred of them down there, and we don't have a we don't have really a flock. It's more of a zoo. <laughs> bunch of wild Indians, man. But you get preaching about heaven around there, they climb the walls, man. They'll run the bases. They go outside the building. I've seen a guy almost knock his baby's head off, carrying the baby around the building, running, banging the kid's head on the wall. <laughs> you see, what makes those folks like that? Oh, they're poor folks. Young men come down and have to live off rice and beans and cockroaches running all over the floor and mosquitoes biting them and walking to school in the rain and carburetors breaking the cars. You talk to heaven about them, it's real. It's real. It ain't to some of you Yankees. And let me tell you, some of you birds up here are 50, 60, 70 years old, and heaven is still in real to you. Don't you think about time you kind of bone up on your homework? You're getting close, bud. <laughs> Lord might take you this year. Going to take you home to a place you don't love. You say, I do love heaven. What do you love about it? Tell me about it. Tell me about it. Brother, get to singing about heaven up here. Let's see your face light up, man. Don't sit there like a tree full of owls and blink, you know. <laughs> you know what God will do sometimes, and I don't like to think about this. Like I say, I don't appreciate this so many more than you do. I don't like to think about these things at all. But I've got to think about them because they're so. You know what God will do sometimes? Sometimes God will reach over the battlements of heaven, reach down in the flock, and pick up some of the little baby lamb. And carry that little baby lamb off to the bower of eternal summer so a mama sheep will get a heart in the right place. See? Now, I don't mean to be unkind, cruel what I'm saying. I'm just saying it so. I heard Lee Robertson preach right after I was saved at a camp down in Pensacola, Florida. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know any of them. I don't know Bob Jones, Billy Sunday, Dwight Moody. I've written a church history since then, but my goodness, when I was saved, I didn't know any of that crew. I know what Wormuth, you know, and... Joe Lewis, Nardy Shaw, and Jack Legs Diamond, you know, and, and Mad Dog Vincent Cole, you know, and Machine Gun Kelly, and, you know, Bonnie and Clyde, and a bunch. And I didn't know about Lee Robertson. I heard him preach the first night. You know what he got up and said? He said this. He said, you know, he said, before God took my little girl, Joy, he said, I was just like any other Baptist preacher. He said, all I knew was John 3.16 and Malachi 3.10. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to see you've been reading your Bibles. <laughs> and he said, after the Lord took my little girl Joy, he said, uh, I began to search the Bible the second coming, about the second coming of Christ. Lee Robertson's preached many times since then, but nine times out of ten when he gets preachers, preachers, somewhere in that sermon, somewhere you'll hear, you know, some glorious morning, he'll preach about the second coming. You know why? He wants to see his little girl again. People, uh, they... The affections aren't in the right place. I knocked at the door one time down in Pensacola, and I never knew that I'd be eventually living within uh, uh, four uh, doors, that house where I knocked. But I knocked at the door there one time, I found a name Hooten. And they just had a little boy been killed, very bad accident. He was uh, running and playing and crossed a picket fence and slipped and fell on it and got caught in the picket fence and, and bled to death. And I talk to that family, and they're very bitter. The woman wasn't bitter as the man. The man was very bitter, and the woman was crying, weeping, and I talked to him about the Lord, and the woman said she was saved, and the man said he was an atheist. And uh, I kept talking with him, talking with him, and finally re found out that he'd received Christ years and years ago. Aren't people strange? They don't, they don't tell you the truth. A fellow Simon atheist, he just says that to impress you. Or else, do you know there are Christians that would like to be atheists? You know why? You're mad at God. You're bitter. Yeah, you're bitter at God. Folks talk about Rugby, he's such a vicious, bitter fella. I'll kid you. I'll fool you, man. I'm not as bitter as you think I am. Some of you folks are a lot, a lot more bitter than I've ever been in my life. You're so bitter, you just sell God out. I ain't ever gotten that bitter. I might, but not yet. Talk to fellow says an atheist, he received Christ, he just mad at God. Yeah. Fellow sitting there saying, Well, I'll tell you what you would got some God. Take a little 10-year-old boy. Bully, why didn't he pick on me? Take a little 10-year-old boy. I'd like to know what a 10-year-old boy did. You know, you hear folks talk that way. And he went on down there, went on down there, and I tried to be as nice and tactful as I could about it, because they were rooting sorrow, and it was a terrible thing. 
But after a while, you know, the dander began to rise, you know, and after a while, the Word of God gets a hold of you, and you can't keep your mouth shut. And finally, after about 20 minutes, I said, uh, do you ever stop thinking about this? I said, you and your wife have both received Christ, but maybe you've just been living down in this world and your heart wasn't in the right place, and maybe God took your little boy home so you get your heart in the right place. And his wife quit crying and looked up for a minute, kind of looking in her face, and he dropped his head. And after a while, he began to bawl like a baby. And he said, well, I guess you're right. We all knelt down there, had prayer, got things fixed up. But sure is a tough way to fix things up, isn't it? If I were you, I wouldn't count too much in down here. Years ago, when I first got saved, I went off to Bob Jones University. I didn't go there to learn the Bible. Thank goodness, I'd have been disappointed if I had. <laughs> but I went up there. You know why I went up there? Because they said nobody up there drank or smoked or went to the theater. That's why I went. They told me about that place. I said, that sounded like a clean place. I've never been to a clean place in my life. I'm going up there and see what the place is like. That's why I went. And I got up there, and the first Sunday I was there, they had a robed choir come in. And the guy that preached had on a clerical collar. And I sat down on the first row, looked at that thing, and I said, my God, man, I just got out of that mess. <laughs> I'm not going to get back in that. And the next Sunday, I left. And I went out in the country to find me a country church. I found me a country church out in a little old community called Pelham. And the pastor's name was Harold Seichler. And this was before he had that one downtown Greenville. I mean, when I went to Pelham, they wouldn't let him on the campus. And I went down to Pelham Baptist Church, and I knew I had the right church, because when I got about two blocks of the church, I could hear the whole place just rocking. Just shaking, man. And boy, I, went, I started in that place, started up the stairs to a prayer meeting, and some old farmer I'd never seen before in my life came running down the stairs, and as he passed me on the first line of the stairway, he picked me up in his arms and hugged me and threw me against the wall and said, Glory to God, and ran on down the stairway. <laughs> and I said, This is the place. This is the right place. So I, I went there. And I went there every, every Sunday that I wasn't preaching in the pulpit, I'd go to Pelham. And one day I came to Pelham one Sunday after a couple of years, I chanced by there and there was a kind of a subdued hush over the congregation, things weren't right. A lot of sniffling, a lot of handkerchiefs out, something was wrong. Brother Sider got up and began to preach, he'd been crying. And I didn't know all the details about what had taken place uh, before that till later. But you know what happened? That old boy went out and a whole evangelistic meeting someplace up in Carolina, and while he was gone, his uh, wife and little daughter were in a car going down the street in Greenville, and some drunk hit him and killed his little girl, and his wife was in the mental ward. And that Sunday after that happened, he wasn't going to preach. He'd quit. He was home and wasn't going to come. Sunday school already started. He was home just sitting there in his living room, head down, head between his knees, saying, Now, Lord, I told all these people they don't tithe, you're liable to do this, and I told these people they don't come to church, you're liable to do this and do that, now look what you did to me. Now, I can't go talk to those people. Now, Lord, I've been telling these people this and that and other thing. Here I was away doing your business and trusting you to take care of my business. While I was away doing your business, you took my little girl. I wasn't going to go. And he wasn't going to go. About that time, there was a knock at the door. And he said, come in. The door opened, and a big old white-haired, tall white-haired mountain preacher came there. His name was Horace Stanberg. Some of these fellows you never hear about. Horace Stanberg is the guy that taught Oliver Green how to preach and Mays Jackson, and J. Harold Smith, and B.B. Caldwell, that whole bunch. Ed Below, all that bunch, that's Harold Stanberg. This time he's about 80 years old. And he walked through that door there and stood in front of Brother Seidler, and Brother Seidler said, uh, what do you want? He said, oh, nothing. He said, well, you have a meeting up in Charlotte, aren't you? He said, yep. And Brother Seidler said, well, what did you come all the way down here to Greenville for? He said, just came out and look at you. Well, what do you want to talk to me about? Nothing. See you around. And start back out the door. <laughs> and Harold said, followed my door and said, but you, did you want to talk to me about something? No. So what did you come down here for? Just to look at you. And the cider said, well, what? what? And Harv stepped through the door, opened the door, stepped out in the porch there and turned around and said, I just traveled down here, he said, about uh, 95 miles to see one preacher in this country that God wasn't afraid to turn the devil loose on. Walked out to his car. How went back in, picked up his Bible, came to church. Amen. He's up in the pulpit this morning preaching. I heard it. 
It was a three-point message. He preached point number one. I'm learning, first of all, that I've been kind of hard in my dealings with some folks, and I'm going to try to be a little bit sweet in my dealings with folks. He said, point number two is that I've learned a fellow never knows how many friends he has till a time like this. And he said, point number three is that I'm learning that all things work together for good to them that love God or the call according to his purpose. <laughs> Bought that house down, boy, moved him like the tree of the forest and moved in a hurricane. I've heard Harold Sider preach at least 50 times since then. Every other sermon he preaches on the rapture. Amen. You know why? He wants to go up and see his little girl. Amen. He'll get up and say, I bless God, you bunch of dead dehydrated back. You know, his voice all burnt out from not preaching right when he was younger. <laughs> he says, you bunch of dead dehydrated back this need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and he says, next Sunday night, Glory to God, I'm going to preach to you on that greatest chapter in all the Bible, that great chapter of all chapters. You don't think he's going to say John 3 and old Romans 10 or something. And he said, that great chapter, 2 Kings 2. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's in 2 Kings 2? Elijah, man, going up to heaven in a, in a whirlwind chance of fire. You know what he wants to do? He wants his little girl again. That's what's going on. All right, take your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Now you understand what we're talking about here. We're talking about why do the, why do the righteous suffer? We're not talking about why wicked people suffer and ungodly people. We're not talking about why backslidden Christians suffer. We're talking about why do the righteous suffer? All right, fourthly, God will let a good, consecrated, dedicated, soul winning, sweet, fine, separated Christian to suffer to prove that his promises mean what they say and say what they mean. Now, I profess to believe the Bible. You know that. If there's a man in this country that professes to believe the Bible any more than I do, I never met him. And yet sometimes I wonder if I believe it or not. You got Philippians 4 there, open your lap, look at verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You believe that? How many believe that? Let me see your hands. You're committed. <laughs> I can do all things through Christ. Amen? I can tithe through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can give above the tithe through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can give up cigarettes through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can live alone if I have to through Christ. See, boy, it gets thin in there, don't it? You know what God will do? God will let you go through all kinds of things till he'll prove to you that that verse means just what it says. I've seen, there's some men in this country know that verse better than I'll ever know it. These fellows say, well, the Greek says this, just don't waste my time, okay? The only way you're going to find out how you can do a thing through Christ but it strengthens you is get in a mess where you need the strength you don't have and get it from Christ. Look down there, verse 19, the same chapter. But my God shall supply all your need through his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You believe that? I believe it. I say I believe it. I must admit, <laughs> there have been times in my life where I swore that must have been a mistranslation or something there. I mean, <laughs> there have been times where for months at a time I could have swore my need wasn't met. But it says it. My God shall supply all you. You know what God will do? God will put you through that thing until you know he said what he meant and meant what he said. Some of you girls sitting here tonight, you're going to wait for God to give you a good Christian husband? Or are you going to cut corners and do like the rest of them do to get you on? I mean, God will supply your need, will he? Or if you need a good husband to get you on, won't he? Suppose he wants you to be an old maid. Can you do all things through Christ with strength and with you? Suppose he doesn't want you to get married. You stay single? People in America think if a woman isn't married by the time she's 18, there's something wrong with her. That's usually a sign something's right with you. <laughs> I'd rather have an old maid in my family than have a son-in-law or something you got. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever hear, here lies the bones of Mary Jones. For her, death held no terrors. She lived an old maid, she died an old maid. No hits, no run, no errors. <laughs> The promise of God. The promise of God state, I can do anything through Christ that will strengthen me. If it will strengthen me, I can do it through Christ. I've got a good friend down there in Pensacola named Clipper. 
Clipper was a deacon in the church I pastored several years back. And that old boy, when he was a deacon in that church, he was one of the finest fellows you've met in your life. I, 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 I'd have taken it pretty if I had 50 deacons like it. Any church can have a little deacon like that, they can stand. That old boy, he made plenty of money, worked for GMAC. He lived a clean life. He raised his kids right. He had family all at home. He tithed and gave above the tithe. He witnessed the Catholics on the job in GMAC. When they had the big old company parties, he'd go to the company party and sit down on the table with his family and order milk and drink it right in front of them. Now, boy, you can use some deacon like that. And then one day a car hit him from behind, messed up his back. He had to have it looked at. The doctor told him if he hurt it again, he'd be in bad trouble. And he got hit again and got in bad trouble. Had to have it operated on. And he came there and laid down the table. When he laid down the table, the doctor took out a big old thing looked like a 12-penny nail. And said, I got to put this in your spinal, in your spinal column. No anesthesia. And, and Clipper noticed a towel folded up at the head of the table where he lying down and said, what's that for? And the doctor said, you can scream in that if you want to. <laughs> and Clipper said, well, I, I'm trying not to. So he lay down and he didn't scream and got through it, but really got messed up, had to wear a brace in his back. And I'll be if about five years later crossing a uh, Lillian Bay Bridge there near Mobile. Some drunk ahead of him at night went across there with a trailer and boat and the thing came loose out in the middle of that bridge in the middle of the night. And at 10.30 at night, he hit into that trailer and boat in the middle of that bridge at about 50 miles an hour. Out went the back again. And he went down the hospital again, and he lay down the same table again. The doc took out the same needle. And Brother Roy said, if you don't mind, I think I'll scream this time. <laughs> <laughs> and went through that thing, and that fellow today is hobbling around on a crutch, you know. And since that time, he has fallen the house and put out his left eye on the fireplace. I thought I was living a separated life as anybody in this building and was witnessing and has probably witnessed more than most of you witnessed. Well, what about that? Let me tell you something. That fellow knows something about those two verses that I don't know right here, right now. I've read that verse, those verses through 94 times and I don't know that verse like Clipper knows it. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. All right, finally. And this is the bad one. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians, look at uh, chapter 12. I think about verse 10. I want a verse there that says, My grace is sufficient for thee. Is that the verse? 9? All right, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. You say, what are you drawing up there? Don't you recognize the scene? That's Paul and Silas in jail. And they're down there made fast in the stocks after many stripes were laid upon them. And down there in jail, and old Silas is saying, Oh, my aching back, man. Paul, when do we get out of here? <laughs> well, be patient, brother. Though the outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed day by day. <laughs> yeah, I know, Paul, that's great, man. But you're, you've been saved a long time, man. I'm a new Christian, man. Are you sure you tried the spirits before we got in this mess over here? <laughs> Oh, yeah, man, I prayed in this man of Macedonia said, come on, help us. Well, that's some help, man. The first night of the meeting, the preacher and the song leader in jail, and I ain't had nothing to drink. I'm thirsty, Paul. They're ever going to give us some water? Well, cheer up, brother. I reckon the suffering of this present time are not worth it. Yeah, I know, Paul, but boy, my back hurts. <laughs> well, brother, cheer up. Let's praise God. And they get singing. That's what's going on there. You know, he told old Paul down in that passage, Paul uh, besought the Lord three times that thorn might be removed from his flesh. And the Lord says, My grace sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I'll glory in my infirmity as the power of Christ rest upon me, because when I'm so far on down to there. Now he says to Paul, he says, My grace sufficient for thee. You know what that thing means? It means something terrible. It means that if push comes to shove, God has said that all you need is him. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. I'd just soon not even think about that. You know what that verse says? That verse says, I don't need my wife. I don't need my kids. I don't need my clothes. I don't need my health. I don't need my ministry. I don't need sunlight. I don't need food. I can be shut up into a dungeon in the dark, the star of the death. And his grace will be sufficient for me.
I don't like to think about that stuff. There it is. What you going to do with it? What you need is God and God's grace, and that's all you need. And I say it with fear and trembling. I mean, I say it aware of the fact that the adversary <laughs> and says, try him out. I don't want to be tried out. <laughs> but if the Lord puts me in that place, that's where I'll be. Years ago in this country, there was a great preacher named Bud Robinson. They call him Uncle Bud. And Uncle Bud didn't believe what I believed. He was a wholeness, you know. And he wasn't like these charismatics, though. I mean, they're something else, man. But, but he, was, he was an old wholeness preacher. And he believed in sanctification. He was a character. And I didn't agree with him on his theology, but uh, he was a sweet fellow and loved the Lord and believed the book. And th he did a lot of good. He founded the Nazarenes. I don't know what kind of condition they're in. Probably the condition the Baptists are in by now. <laughs> and you take old Uncle Bud Robinson, when he got to be about 59 years old, he got hit by a car some city up north here. And when that car hit him, it knocked him eight feet in the air and ten feet down ahead of him and then ran over him again in the street. And he was lying there with two compound fractures, busted ribs, blood all over the place. And that guy that hit him was going on past him, put on the brakes, and a cop right there in the corner was running after that car, screaming and cursing and blowing his whistle. And as he ran over, passed, passed by Bud, cursing, Bud said, now don't talk that way. I don't like to hear folks talk that way. <laughs> and they picked that old boy and got him out of the hospital and got him down there about, oh, about 10 o'clock at night. A bunch of young men began to pour hydrogen peroxide over him and cut off his clothes. One of them said, the old man, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a preacher. Bud had a kind of a lisp in those days, couldn't talk too plain. And he said, I'm a preacher. And they said, well, uh, preacher, you'll be needing all the patience you've been preaching about before you get out of here. And they put them over there in the death ward. A lot of them died in those days before they had time to get to them. And long about 6 o'clock in the morning up there where some of them were dying, waiting for the doctors and things, a Catholic priest came through there about 6 in the morning, giving absolute contrition, you know, the last rites for the dying, you know, and came with his, you know, his beads and candles and prayer wheel and monkey suit and all that business. <laughs> And he came, he meeny, miny, more. And he came through there, and he came up alongside Bud and said, uh, is there something you want to confess, son? And he said, yes, sir, I want to confess Jesus Christ, my Savior. Glory. <laughs> the priest pulled back. And, is there anything else? <laughs> and he said, yes, I want to save, able to save, and sanctify, and fill with the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. <laughs> that priest shot out of there like a rat going out of a sewage pipe. And about... Nine o'clock in the morning, in came a doctor, and he took one look at him, and he said, well, Bud, here's what he had. He had one foot turned around backwards, just clear back in the socket. Compound fracture here, the bone splinter clear through, stuck in the shirt, before they cut the stuff off him. A couple of busted ribs, and then other bruising things. And the doc said, well, I think we can save the leg. We'll have to cut off the arm. Got gangrene in there, and, and Bud said, well, I threw it. You could save it. And the doctor said, well, I, I, I could work on it. I know what to do, but you probably couldn't stand the pain. And Bud said, well, I'm a Christian, and I can do all things through Christ with strengtheneth me. And the doctor said, well, I'm not a Christian. I'm an atheist. I don't know what a Christian is, but if you think you can take it, we'll try it. So they tried it. Make a long story short, they worked on him about six weeks. You hang that thing up in there, pus dripping off it. The doctor would come there and take a scalpel and scrape that bone. And old Bud would lie there and pass in and pass out and have comas and dream about New Jerusalem and you know, he'd come back in there you know and sit in line that bed you know glory to God you know with sweat streaming off his face first time that doctor came in Bud said now doctor he said I know you're not trying to hurt me he said I know you're doing the best you can I want to have you know something he said I love you and he said I want to have you live forever with me in heaven and the doctor said yeah yeah okay well, let's get on it and he said, down there about the second week, the doctor would come in, and Bud would say, now, doctor, I know you're doing the best you can for me, and I know you don't mean to hurt me. I just want to tell you, I love you, and I'm praying for you. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> about the fourth week, he'd come in there and sit down there, you know, Bud praising God through the whole thing, and he'd come in there, and Bud said, now, doctor, so I'm still praying for you, and I love you. I want to have you live forever with me in heaven. The doctor would say, yeah, well, okay, well, get the, get the bandage on the and get working on him. And boy, after about six weeks, they came to a place there where the doctor saw some stage in the thing where whatever he was after it was cleaned out, and they're going to make it. And before he knew what he was saying, he said, glory to God, we made it. <laughs> <laughs> Bud left the hospital about two weeks later, and going out there at the door, he met that doctor by the hallway, and the doctor put his arm around him, 
and said, Bud, he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, before you came here, he said, I don't believe any such a thing as a Christian. But he said, I've been watching you and work with you, and i, I got to admit, you're, you're, you're a Christian. And he said, I want to ask you a question. Bud said, what's that? He said, do you still want to have me uh, live forever in heaven with you? And Bud said, yeah, I sure do. And the doctor said, I think I'd be real nice, Bud, real nice. And he got saved. He got saved. You know what Bud found out? Bud found out his grace was sufficient. Paul was getting whipped. Lash was coming down. Blood was running down to his feet. I can take it. I can take it, Lord. I can take it. <laughs> or that thing. But uh, how about this thorn? You get the thorn out of my back. <laughs> and the thorn stays. And he's holding the scupper as the ship. Ooh, shipwreck free time, man. Day and night in the deep. He's out there in the bills, you know, with the rats and, you know, and cashing his cookies like this. <laughs> and he's out there having a time of it and lie, oh God, I may never get through this thing. I don't mind the persecution. I don't mind the sickness. No, but, but Lord, the thorn, will you take it? Confessed all his sins he committed, probably several he hadn't committed, and judged all his sins and got right and cleaned up. And Lord, for Jesus' sake, for the glory of God, this thorn is in the ministry. Would you please do something about this thorn? <laughs> And the Lord just reached over the bottom of heaven and put his thumb in that thorn and pushed that thorn in about a quarter of an inch deeper. And he said, Paul, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. That's one of the toughest verses of the Bible. And he wasn't backslidden. And he wasn't out of fellowship. He was righteous. And he was hurting. Come ye disconsolate, where ye languish, come to the mercy seat, fervently kneel. Here bring your wounded heart, here tell all your anguish. Earth hath no sorrows that heaven cannot heal. Here see the bread of life, see water flowing forth from the throne of God. Pure from above, come to the feast of love, come ever knowing, earth hath no sorrows that heaven cannot heal. You know the tragedy of it, folks? The tragedy of it is that somebody here tonight in this building is going to die without Christ, and you're going to a place where you're never going to be through with it. It's going to be suffering and sorrow and tears with you forever. We Christians are going to get out after a while. We get release. But you won't. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Bless the message tonight. I pray the Holy Spirit of God, the honor the Word of God. You said your word would not return to your void, but accomplish the purpose where until you sent it. And I know some Christians here have some tough roads to hold, like they say, and some tough hills to sled. And some of them have it much rougher than I do. You've been very gentle to me. And if I have any greatness about me, it'd be your gentleness that has made me great. And I couldn't have taken the blow some of the brethren have taken. And I know it here on my knees. I want to be very careful about these things, Lord. Tread softly in a broken heart. And Lord, for some Christian here tonight under terrible pressure and terrible suffering and, and terrible disappointment and depression, I pray that you, the Comforter, will minister to them and show them it'll, it'll be over. And if you contend with them, I want you to show them why. Let's remain in prayer. The head bowed and eyes closed like to have organist play something for us for a while while we remain in prayer. When Alex Dunlap died, fine Christian fellow, loved the Lord, believed the book. 
he said, when I got so bad I couldn't stand it, I'd sit up at night all night long and put on the tape recorder and play Brother Pete's sermon on why did the righteous suffer. When I heard about that, I said to myself, my God, what a responsibility a preacher has when he opens his mouth. Father, undertake tonight, is anybody here trying to save? I pray they'll see that Jesus, their Savior, that suffered and bled and died for them. They don't have to suffer just for their sins. They don't have to suffer in now and then suffer in hell forever. They can suffer for a good purpose in this life and be through with it at death. Help them to see it, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Now, I'm not going to give a long invitation tonight. Normally, when I preach, I never even give an invitation the first night. Maybe I'm kind of premature tonight, I don't know. So we're not going to give a long invitation. We are going to sing a couple of stanzas. And I'm sure Brother Grace has personal workers here. Be ready here to meet you when you come. Ready to receive you. If you're here tonight, you have never received the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, you ought to do that tonight. The brother preached before me, Brother Keene, told you all about it. He made it real clear. You couldn't have missed it. He made it real clear. The sacraments, religion, baptism, those things can't save you. He made it real clear. Now Christ can save you. Come on, what are we saying, brother? Just as I am without one plea. I read a passage of the Bible one time where David said, Thou tellest all my wanderings, put my tears into thy bottle, are they not in thy book? He was talking about God collecting uh, lacrimatories, bottles filled with tears. Now, I'm, a, I'm a, a joker. You know what? I'm a juvenile. You know that. You people know me for years. You haven't seen me grown, probably grown a foot since you first knew me in any way. I'll always remain, you know, I, I love a good laugh. I love, I think you lost your sense of humor, you lost about half your religion, man. But I'm not kidding myself about reality. This old world is a veil of tears, brethren. And sooner or later it's going to catch up with you. I'm a, when it comes to having a good time, messing around, horsing around, I'm, I'm a big character you ever saw in your life. But I know what's going to happen if the Lord tarries. Taxes, Roman Catholic Church, communism, Hospital bills, graves, nothing to laugh about. Now listen, do you, do you want to suffer forever? Haven't some of you had enough of it? We Christian people, we're waiting for Jesus Christ to come back. And if he were to come back tonight, all our problems are over. Amen. And if he were to come back tonight, your problems would just be starting. They'd just be starting. Why don't you end it? You've got men and women down here, personal workers, lead you to Christ and 10, 15 seconds. Why don't you come? Why don't you take advantage of the opportunity you have tonight? There's nobody here to make merchandise out of you. I'm no professional actor or pitch man, con man trying to sell you something. Nobody's got up here tonight and tried to push you in the back door of a church or run you in a baptismal pool before you receive Jesus Christ. Why don't you take advantage of it tonight? You've got men and women here that love you and want to help you. Let's sing one more stand. If nobody comes, we're going to close. You want to receive the Lord Jesus, step out and come while we sing. Come on. The Lord dealing with you, step out and come on. Come on, we'll wait for you.